In today's episode, my aim is to help you understand a very simple question. Do viruses become more virulent or disease causing over time, or do they become more avirulent or more sort of benign over time? So we're gonna lean on some science, review some data, going back and, and going back to the early 1900s. I mean, this question has been proposed for a very long time, and recently now scientists are actually looking at this to see, hey, what is going to be the, be the trend of SARS-CoV-2 as it becomes more endemic, as, as it becomes more of kind of a mainstay pathogen that we're all going to be exposed to perpetuity, just like other beta coronavirus viruses that humans have been exposed to for a very long time that are attributable or attributed to causing the common cold. So we're going to lean on some science. This is not a conspiracy video. This is not a political video or podcast. This is literally just hoping to help you understand this idea of the law of diminishing returns or the law of, as uh, Theobald Smith says, the law of declining virulence. Okay. So this has been, again, talked about and theorized and reviewed uh, for a very, very long time. Now, if you think about what a virus is, um, a virus is a parasite. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. So without your own self, uh, you know, your tissues, your proteins, uh, your macromolecules, your glucose, viruses cannot live. They, they just, you know, they're benign in nature. They, they go from another animal or another, you know, uh, you know, species or organism and they infect you. Okay. They, they can't just live, you know, on a bush or on, uh, you know, on a, uh, a, a surface for, for perpetuity. They, they require your own, uh, materials. And so this is, they are a parasite, just like a parasite relies upon your nutrition, your food, uh, your glucose, your blood. I mean, there's a lot of different requirements. So they, they cannot live without being, uh, you know, hijacking your own cellular machinery. This is how they function. Okay. Now it's it. That being said, it's in the best interest of a parasite or a virus to uh, not totally eradicate or kill all of its hosts because they're, then they would not survive anymore. That would be sort of deleterious in terms of, in terms of natural selection or its evolutionary fitness. That would be maladaptive. The genes and the traits and the behavioral sort of mechanisms that, that increase lethality like that would not be selected for uh, if all these hosts were dying because... Uh, people would, would be able to see that, right? Like, oh my gosh, uh, everyone is dying from this. I'm going to stay in my home. I'm not going to leave anywhere. And then the virus would, would go away and it would disappear. Uh, but so what, what ha tends to happen, and this has been theorized again by Theobald Smith and many other bacteriologists and virologists and, and infectious disease experts, that as these obligate intracellular parasites, also known as viruses in lay speak, as they infect more hosts, what tends to happen is there's a, like a flipping of the transmissibility. The transmissibility increases and the virulence goes down over time. Now, this has been theorized to happen in this particular case with SARS-CoV-2. Now, I know you're not hearing about this on the mainstream television because you're hearing more and more fear-mongering about the Delta variant, which I'm going to get to shortly, but I would like you to understand this paper right here. The title of this, and this was published in February of 2021, the title is Immunological Characteristics Govern the Transition of COVID-19 Endemicity, meaning that this virus will become endemic just like all the other beta coronaviruses that infect humans, that infect children, that are, um, you know, that cause the common cold, okay? So this is a great paper by a, a, public, uh, a scientist over at Emory University outside of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, a Dr. Levine. Now, this is not the Levine that's, that's at Stanford. This is someone else. Okay. Now, before we continue on, I do just want to address some of these technical briefings from the UK. SARS-CoV-2 variant of concern and variants under investigation in England. And this is technical briefing number 18. I think they're up to 21 at this point. Now, what's unique about the UK is compared to a lot of other countries, is they are sequencing the confirmed cases to figure out which variant is infecting these individuals. And so what you see here is a progressive decline in its case fatality ratio. So what you're seeing here is the alpha variant, there's 220,000 confirmed cases and 4,000 deaths, which led to a case fatality rate of 1.9%. Now, the number of confirmed sequence confirmed Delta variant cases was 82,000 cases and it only killed 112 individuals. Now that case fatality rate is, is 0.2%. Okay, so if you think that's significantly lower than the Gen 1 or the wild type SARS-CoV-2. Now, some people will say, well, Mike, I mean, you're not accounting for the fact that 
more and more people are getting vaccinated in the UK. I think it's about 63 or 66 percent, something like that, of the population is double vaccinated. So, okay, if that is true, then why is there so much fear mongering from mainstream uh, network television and so forth saying that we need to be even fully vaccinated people need to mask again? If we now know from 82,000 cases, that's a pretty solid, again, sequence confirmed cases with the Delta variant, we, only 112 deaths. I mean, you know, 0.2% in terms of case fatality ratio. So if that latter argument is true that, oh, it's if you're immunized, then you don't really have to worry about, then there's a lot of people are being immunized. A lot of people, you, you know, especially if you have comorbid conditions, if you're over the age of 65, like if, you, if you're in regular contact with elderly people or immune compromised people, then you should be immunized, right? Then what is the big concern about this? Now, what I will say is this particular uh, report is accounting for the fact uh, they do actually look at people uh, who have been immunized and not, but they haven't organized that data uh, with specifically to the Delta variant. But there is a large sample, I think over 12,000 subjects that have been um, tested positive that are not immunized. So anyway, that that is something that is being recorded here. But let's continue on and dive into this, this work of the law of diminishing returns, also known as uh, the law of dec declining uh, violence by uh, Theobald Smith and, and talk about this and talk about the sort of inverse relationship between tra transmissibility and virulence. Uh, but first, I do want to introduce myself. I am Mike Mutzel. I'm grateful that you're tuning into High Intensity Health. If you enjoy this content, you can share this with a friend or family member. You can just text this podcast to them. You can hit that like button over on YouTube. And if you think that we're putting out good content and you enjoy this content, you can support our sister companies that we can hire more researchers, more writers, and deliver more uh, succinct science-based content like this by hopping on over to myoscience.com. That's myoscience with an X. We can be your supplier for amazing science-based third-party tested raw materials like vitamin D, liquid uh, vitamin D in, an org in uh, MCT oil, a whole bunch of sleep support, nutrients, and much more. And you can use the coupon code podcast over at checkout. So you can hop on over to myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com. Use the code, uh, the code <laughs> podcast at checkout. Okay, so let's get into, into some of this stuff in a lot more detail. Uh, I, I, again, I spent a lot of time researching into this, and there's quite a few articles on this idea of this law of declining virulence. Now, Theobald Smith was one bacteriologist, and there's been many other immunologists and so forth that have been studying this for a while, to theorize that infectious diseases from an evolutionary perspective tend to trend to a more endemic, more benign uh, sort of uh, infection course as they infect more hosts. Now, what you're going to see here is what I think is is quite fascinating, and this is the um, the rate, the, the sort of relationship between transmissibility and virulence. And so, you've heard of this R not uh, curve, and this is how transmissible is a virus. And the way that they measure this is. Um, so, uh, you know, you take uh, sort of an index case and how many secondary cases uh, are attributed to that. And that's sort of its, its replication number. And it seems that there is actually an inverse relationship between the r naught and the virulence. And so you, you really, you know, the more transmissible a, a virus is, um, it, it seems that over, over time that it becomes less virulent. Now, this is what's interesting is in regards to what's going on right now with regards to the Delta variant is we're hearing so much more is, oh my gosh, you can catch this thing in like two seconds. Like you walk by someone in a grocery store and they, they sneeze or this or that, and you can catch this thing. Like you don't need to be exposed to people for as long. And so that, it just, it made me think, okay, well, if it's that much more transmissible, then, it, you know, historically speaking, just speaking historically, if we, if we can lean on history. And I think history is a great way to understand the world because nature and life and people tend to sort of repeat themselves. If this virus behaves like historically, like many other viruses and many other parasites do, then that would mean that it's, it's violence is going down over time. Now, what, what I like to look at is, is hospitalizations and deaths. Okay. Those have not increased. Okay. Now, some of you might say, well, of course that's because people are immunized. Okay. Well, so if immunized people are protected and they're not dying, 
then why are we so hyper-focused on the increased transmissibility? Uh, and, and so this is, I think society has sort of come to this place where we we have these sort of bad memories of what COVID can be. And so we really want to minimize cases at all costs. And we're not sort of coming to terms with the new reality in that this is not, you know, people are not dying like they were. Like, you know, we have these indelibly inked pictures of what New York used to be like in, in you know, March and April of 2020. It's not like that anymore. Now, I'm sure there's some one-off or there are small isolated examples of, of people that get very sick and, and have unfortunate situations and so forth. Forth, which is why I do want to continue to share with you some data that I, in my quest to understand this sort of inverse relationship between transmissibility and virulence, I came across some interesting articles from the 1918 Spanish flu or the, the, the pandemic of 1918. Now, what was interesting about that, it, it's funny, research is pretty awesome like this. You start diving into one aspect of, of something, whether it's insulin resistance or obesity or hypertrophy and muscle building, and then you, you, you know, sort of one article begets another. And as fate would have it, there was a lot of articles that were reviewing sort of the origins of the Spanish flu, the, 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 the deadliest pandemic of human history and so forth. And guess what? They actually found that, that 12,000 tons of respiratory contaminants were leaked in the years prior to the outbreak in key sites where a lot of soldiers died in the First World War, uh, you know, and they also got really sick and infected and, and it, it was the origins of the outbreak. And so there was mustard gas, there was all these um, you know, different uh, sulfide you know, type gases and so forth. I'll, I'll put a list here of, of all the different uh, gases and so forth. And it reminded me of what we're not really hearing about in the media. And that is that host susceptibility in the terrain is something that we always need to consider. And here we have this article, I think it was published about five years ago, that is saying, hey, look, historically, we have sort of forgotten that, you know, that, that the you know, 1918 flu, uh, the Spanish flu, influenza outbreak and so forth, pandemic what you know what coincided with that was a was use of mustard gas and a lot of really caustic or toxic respiratory gases that actually made the soldiers more susceptible and and started the whole pandemic and it it made me think about the fact that gosh we're really on a societal level sort of ignoring that we're we're not talking about the fact that you know, a super majority of people that are in the hospital or they get severely sick have these diseases caused by poor nutrition choices, poor exercise choices, price circadian rhythm disruptions, or are in cities where there's a lot of, um, you know, bad air and urbanization and, and, you know, diesel fume exhaust and, and all of that. So we really need to sort of constantly remember that we are the hosts and these obligate intracellular parasites or viruses are infecting us. And if our health is already, you know, sort of on the decline, then what would be sort of a non-virulent infection could actually go into and to be very severe because our host machinery is already compromised. So uh, as we sort of finish off of this podcast and, and sort of talk about this and and hopefully you've enjoyed some of these these videos or images that, that I've been sharing with you and, and so forth. And we can read some quotes as we um, you know continue on. But it's it's important to understand that that host health really matters. And this is actually being again historically reviewed in the context of the 1918 uh, flu and so forth. So um an Australian immunologist back in uh, the, the 1980s, uh, his name, he won the Nobel Prize. His name is Frank uh, McFarren Burnett, uh, declared, it is self-evident that if both the host and the parasite are to survive a mild, rather lasting infection, which does not cause serious damage to the host and provides adequate opportunity for the parasites to be transferred to other hosts, is the most advantageous relationship for both. So if you think about that, it's not in the best interests of viruses or these obligate intracellular parasites to completely eradicate and kill the host. A, a sort of, uh, you know, an infection that, that makes people sick and, and so forth, uh, but also uh, uh, is highly transmissible, is the, the best sort of survival strategy uh, um, for this, for this for this trade-off. And so again, we always need to remember this transmission versus virulence trade-off. And when I say the word virulence, um, that's really speaking to uh, the seriousness of the infection. So um, anyway, there's there's a lot of different things here that, that we can uh, get into. 
Uh, and just sort of finishing off, um, I think it's really important that you read the paper from Levine because she eloquently explains why SARS-CoV-2 could become a seasonal virus causing little mortality at the population level. Uh, and the essential ingredients for this reasoning are the fact that the infectious fatality ratio strongly depends upon age and that Im immunity prevents severe disease. Uh, and it's long lasting. And so this is, again, very important. And I just want to finish off with uh, some sort of end of one you know, feedback. As many of you know, I got exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in the, uh, the fall or early winter of, of 2020. Um, so it was like November 29th is when I was exposed. I think I got really, you know, you know, sort of started to feel the symptoms and so forth. And my most symptomatic day was the 2nd of December. And so I've tested my antibodies now three separate times. So I tested them in uh, January. I'm sorry, maybe it was the end of December. Yeah, it was December. And then it was uh, February, April. And then again, I just tested them here uh, in sort of mid-July. And guess what? My antibodies now quantitative antibodies to the spike protein are quantitatively higher now than they were in April. So maybe I was re-exposed and maybe my antibodies had a you know reason to increase. I'm not really sure as to why they would be higher, but this idea that immunity doesn't last, uh, I, I really think that, um, I don't know why that's being propagated. Obviously there are, you know, small percentage of reinfections. I think it's like 0.2% or something or or 1%. Like it's very low. Um, it's definitely single digit percentages. Um, but this idea that, that we are not making immunologic memory to these different pathogens, I think has been sort of an area that has, for whatever reason, not really been talked about. Uh, and there was actually data from, I believe it was Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic that looked at this and found that uh, people with natural immunity are, are are protected from this. And so we, we have more and more data uh, to sort of lean on when it comes to natural immunity. And just uh, my example, for you know, my antibodies are quantitatively higher now than they were uh, in April. And so, you know, conventional wisdom would, would, would lead you to think that that is not true, that this is an anomaly, that this couldn't really be happening and so forth. But uh, this is why I encourage you to test your antibodies if you uh, indeed have been exposed and I'll share with you the results of my T cell immunity, the T detect test as well. So that's coming up on a future episode down the road. But friends, hopefully you found this information helpful. Please check out the show notes because what I link there is the papers. Uh, the more that we can understand this, the more that we can talk about this, the more that we can have intellectually stimulating conversations, whether it's online or offline with your friends or family or colleagues or coworkers. Uh, I think it's, I think it's cool. You know, we can have these conversations and uh, it's always great to uh, talk about science. Obviously uh, I'm, I'm biased in that regard, but uh, I'm just grateful that you're here. I'll put links to the show notes below and we will catch you on a future episode down the road. Appreciate you tuning in. Bye now.